Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Katrine Mikhail, and I work for teaching uh, research. Started, I wanted to uh, captioning is available for this session. And in order to turn it on, there is an option at bottom of the screen in the Zoom toolbar that is uh, show types. If you cannot see it, uh, you may need to click on more to find that option. Also, at the end of the session, there will be an anonymous survey uh, as a QR code that you can scan with your phone and a link in the chat. With that being said, I'm going to turn it over to our presenters. Thank you. Thanks, Katrine. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us this morning to talk about eco-anxiety in our classes. I'm Megan Lickey. I'm the Director of Sustainability here at AU. I've been at AU for almost 10 years. I'm going to turn it over to my co-presenters to introduce themselves. Angela, would you like to go first? Yes. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Angela Gayasitz. I am a professorial lecturer in the literature department. I primarily am teaching writing courses um, in the writing program. And most relevant for this presentation, I also teach a complex problems course in the core um, program as well. And Danielle? Hey there, everyone. Um, my name is Danielle Vogel. I joined the faculty at AU at the beginning of last school year. I am an AU graduate. I graduated from our law school in 2007. Um, and I am a sustainable entrepreneur. I teach within our management program, and I'm also the assistant director of the Bulwark Center for Entrepreneurship. Prior to joining the faculty, I ran a climate-motivated small business in DC. And before that, um, I was an environmental policy advisor on Capitol Hill for 10 years. Great. Um, so uh, thank you all for joining us. Um, we're going to talk about addressing eco-anxiety uh, in our classrooms through communal and action-oriented teaching. Um, today, we will uh, help you all to recognize the prevalence of eco-anxiety and the proven approaches to addressing it. We'll explain a couple of frameworks uh, that you'll be able to use in your classes to bring eco-anxiety into the discussion. And we're going to talk about creating a community between all of the departments on campus that are teaching sustainability to help us all learn from each other as we explore these ideas in our classes. So we'll start with a background on eco-anxiety, and then I'll introduce the first framework using a Venn diagram to pull this new material into a class. Angela will provide an example um, of how she uses that thinking in her class. I'll also talk about a liter literature review on eco-anxiety that was done by the NIH and the um, key concepts that came out of that. And then Danielle will provide another example of that framework being used in her class. We'll also talk about how we can continue this conversation in the most productive way for all of us before having a discussion about how we might, how each of you might use these ideas in your classes and how we can kind of keep this going as we move forward with questions. So first, I assume that you're all joining today because you've either had eco-anxiety come up in a class that you've taught, or maybe you've experienced eco-anxiety and want to think more deeply about how we can all work together to solve these problems. And we're lucky to have a lot more data coming out all the time about the prevalence of eco-anxiety and thinking through what might be proven solutions to manage it and to turn it into actual action that can be um, alleviating for those feelings. And so the, there's an, a number of different resources that we've turned to to figure out what is the prevalence of eco-anxiety and why are we seeing it? And so our Science Institute <coughs> um, <coughs> recently shared their data around environmental thinking, and they showed that young people today really are thinking about a healthy environment as a number one priority, specifically a number one priority for elected officials. So we know that um, our students are thinking about this all the time. And a survey that my office did in the fall around environmental uh, literacy, as well as culture on campus, showed that 81% of our respondents agreed or strongly agreed that they have a responsibility to live sustainably, but only 66% of um, the respondents felt like their actions had an impact. So we begin to see that discrepancy between a need for action and feeling like 
their action matters and is meaningful. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Excuse me. Additional data that came out of the Yale program on climate change shows that right now 65% of American adults are worried about global warming, but only 35% of them are talking about it. And that can lead to this real feeling of isolation and these feelings about wanting to do something about global warming, wanting to know more about it, wanting to understand their impact on it, and feeling like you have community in that, that we can all move forward collectively. Uh, Angela and I, along with Professor Erica Hart, wrote an article about eco-anxiety that's in uh, this spring's CTRL Beat. So if you want to go a little bit more deeply into some of these topics, I encourage you to, to read that um, in CTRL Beat. <laughs> so it's important to, to recognize that climate anxiety is valid. It's really rooted in science, right? Our students are attending classes where they're learning about environmental problems and the potentially very vast and deeply life altering implications of um, climate change. And then they understandably can leave with anxiety about these huge changes that we're going to see in our planet during their lifetime. So it's important to note that it's, it's not a pathology. It's really rooted in real science and it's important to acknowledge that in our classes. Society though really pushes for us to ignore it, right? Um, I'm sure in the last day you have seen an ad selling you that you can just go to Target and buy things that are going to make you feel better about everything and everything. Um, and that push to ignore it can really deepen that sense of isolation. Like we shouldn't be talking about it. We have all this other stuff that's more important that we should talk about instead. And that isolation can lead to helplessness. So um, <clears throat> we now know, thanks to a lot of research, and in addition to anecdotes that we might have already known, um, that climate action and climate community can really be antidotes to climate anxiety and isolation. And if we can pull that stuff into our classes, then we can use our classes not only to teach about um, the environmental issues that might be relevant to your coursework, but also how can our students turn that into something meaningful. And if you attended this morning's uh, opening plenary, some of these ideas came up that are needed for student retention and that our students are really looking for this sense of well being and community on our campus. And so we can use these topics of climate change to help to meet some of AU's bigger needs right now as well. <clears throat> so now I'm going to go into the first framework for how we can pull this into our classes. So this is a climate action Venn diagram that was created by Dr. Ayanna Elizabeth Johnson. Um, Dr. Johnson is a climate activist. She's a marine biologist. And in her work, she talks about how she had has had a lot of people come up to her to ask what they should do for the environment. And recognizing that it's not a one size fits all. Everybody needs to do the same thing. There are really as many <laughs> things that uh, need to be done as there are people. She created this framework to use to help people figure out where they should focus their climate action. And it's the intersection of what brings you joy, what are you good at, and what work needs doing. And if we want to use this as a framework in our classes, we can think about the subject that you're teaching as something that brings you joy and assume that the students who are signing up for that class are also going to get some joy out of that subject. We can think about what you're good at as the skills and the um, resources that you're bringing into the class. So what are you specifically bringing into that environment that our students could use as a new tool <laughs> to uh, conduct climate research? And then what needs doing? Well, what specific climate action, climate uh, issues are coming up in your class that you could address? So I'll turn it over to Angela now to give an example. All right. Thanks, Megan, um, and welcome everyone. Uh, so I wanna start off by talking about the complex problem course that I teach that um, is really relevant for <clears throat> eco-anxiety in particular. So if you're not familiar, the complex problems um, courses are core program, are core courses um, that are deliberately interdisciplinary and they're all organized around some type of complex problem that can be best understood through multiple disciplinary lenses. So the course that I teach, Clothed in Justice, is looking at the complex problem of the fashion industry globally 
as the intersection of you know, a lot of very practical need for um, clothing ourselves and self-expression and cultural significance, but also through the production of those needed things, um, exploitation of human work and um, also exploitation of the environment. So focusing specifically on the environment as the really relevant um, aspect here, the um, fashion industry involves a significant carbon footprint. Uh, just to start with, when you think about just purely the amount of shipping that happens in order for clothes that have been purchased online to actually make it to your place of residence from the place it was produced. That's a huge carbon footprint in and of itself. But then if you start working backward throughout the supply chain and the shipping alone between different parts of production uh, is significant um, and it is growing. There are other aspects of climate impact as well uh, and environmental impact as well. There is, of course, the use of resources to create clothes in terms of the land used to grow crops like cotton or linen or the land used to raise animals that, you know, have wool or very significantly all of these synthetic fabrics that are made from what is essentially plastic, which is, of course, oil. So, you know, those are all significant resource uses that contribute to environmental impacts. And then as well, you have, um, you know, all the dyeing and processing, which involves a lot of, of chemicals. So all of those are significant environmental impacts that are talked about in this particular course, which really naturally leads into discussions that where eco-anxiety comes up where students are expressing the anxiety and the course can be a vehicle for helping those students process that anxiety. In terms of the Venn diagram, I wasn't, um, hadn't encountered um, Dr. Ayana Elizabeth Johnson's Venn diagram previously, but that is exactly the framework that I ended up using to come up with this complex problems theme. I personally love to create garments. Um, I sew, I knit, it's a creative outlet for me. I get a lot of joy from it. Um, so that is, you know, skills and interests. And then the area of climate, um, you know, need is very much, um, you know, looking at the fashion industry, which is incredibly relevant for our students. Um, they are part of the population that drives demand and keeps this industry going. Um, and there's growing awareness of this being a problem. So they're, they're definitely interested in this problem, but also definitely need a lot of you know, education in this, this, um, these systems. So it was really a very natural fit as a complex problem design. Um, so... That can be potentially a way, if you're thinking about course design, to be finding the corner where your interests and your skills intersect with um, you know, teaching possibility. Moving on to thinking about actually engaging with eco-anxiety in the classroom. As I said earlier, eco-anxiety comes up really naturally in this course framework. Um, it's definitely, um, as we're looking at the complex systems that shape the um, global fashion industry through the different disciplinary lenses, um, there's a lot of opportunities and situations where we're talking about environmental impacts, we're talking about um, how um, those intersect with these students' lived daily experiences. Um, so one of the most important things I think you, you can be doing in the classroom to address eco-anxiety is to discuss it directly, name it, acknowledge that it exists, acknowledge that it's real, you know, talk about your own experiences of eco-anxiety if you have them. Um, I certainly have eco-anxieties of various kinds. Um, and this course is, is honestly a vehicle for me to take climate action. 
and um, you know confront those myself. But um, yeah, students want to talk about these things. Students want to know that um, you know their their experiences of eco anxiety are real and legitimate. And um, there's a lot of discussion happening in the way this course is designed. It's very much a discussion discussion driven course. So creating a space for honest listening and sharing and processing of um, you know how the new information they're learning about these systems um, you know affects their lives and how they fit into that bigger picture is really significant for these students and using different disciplinary lenses to do that. Um, and part of using those disciplinary lenses is a way of acknowledging complexity. Um, these are complex systems. They're not going to um, be fixed with one quick magic thing, right? We got into this pickle environmentally that we have at this stage um, for a lot of reasons over a long period of time. Um, there's going to be a lot of um, different courses of action that are going to need to be taken to you know, move away from the, our current set of problems. So acknowledging complexity and also, um, you know, through all of that, helping students reject paralysis. I think paralysis happens, uh, you know, anxiety creates paralysis a lot of the time, um, but gaining understanding of all of the systems that drive what's going on, you know, gaining that knowledge can be one way of, you know, of diminishing anxiety and also um, moving to, okay, what do we do with this knowledge now? So um, some practical things about what does that actually look like in the classroom? How does that happen? Um, I'm going to point to two types of activities that um, I've used in various ways. Um, one is once once we've looked at a certain aspect of the um, you know fashion industry as a complex problem through a particular disciplinary lens, potentially economics, potentially um, sociology or anthropology, potentially environmental science, right? One of the things we always do is we go back to um, small groups in the classroom and having a space for students to, in those small groups, working independently, do some brainstorming about potential actions on the individual level or on collective levels, and having them do research in class to see you know, what is viable, what's possible. And then again, coming back to the bigger class space, talking through possibility, thinking, of, um, thinking together through, okay, what are potential outcomes? What are potential problems? How viable is or, or would be any of these actions? What kind of impact would they have? So that's one um, you know, classroom move that definitely happens multiple times throughout the semester. And I think that's a really important one because it allows students with their different experiences and different perspectives to work collectively to um, process possibility for action and figure out what makes sense for them um, to take action. And um, you know, making those spaces for students is really important. It can be tempting to tell students all of the things that you have in your head about resources and um, the things that you've learned and just you know, stay in that telling mode. M making spaces for them to do that investigation is really important. The other thing that is definitely more unique to this course um, is I have them do a closet survey and it's very much a neutral activity. I want them to describe the things they discover. Where are their clothes made? What fabrics are their clothing made from? How much clothing do you ha actually have in your wardrobe? Do you actually wear all of that? What kinds of garments do you have? How do you feel about those garments? And this is really, again, something that um, is a more personal processing. I have them write a journal about this. I don't set specific outcomes for what kinds of conclusions I want them to draw. They do that themselves, but creating spaces for students to engage with their lived reality in the context of these bigger 
issues and questions um, is really important. So um, really eco-anxiety um, addressing activities is very much, um, I want them to find their own joy in um, and their own interest in how they um, deal with that anxiety. And that's definitely part of how the classroom activities are framed, um, is helping students identify what's going to work for them in a long-term, big picture uh, kind of way that applies to the specific issue of the fashion industry, but they can also transfer, <laughs> transfer to addressing other um, dimensions of climate anxiety. Um, I think that's it for me. Um, let's go back to Megan. Thanks, Angela. So the next framework that we're going to share um, is, is much different. It is from an NIH review of eco-anxiety research that was done. And ultimately they looked at 34 works that um, addressed eco-anxiety interventions. And after reviewing those 34 works, they came up with a list of um, themes that came up in, in the papers. And there are four themes that we're gonna to discuss today in the NIH review, you'll actually see a fifth theme. That fifth theme is really focused on the practitioner. So um, this is for psychologists. And so <clears throat> I do actually think there's some parallels though to what um, clinical caregivers might be doing to prepare themselves to work with people with eco-anxiety and what we as teachers and faculty members can do um, kind of behind the scenes for ourselves before we work with the students. And so we'll talk more about that at the end of the presentation. Um, but for this, the four themes that came up were first fostering inner resilience. And that's really allowing students to acknowledge their feelings and that, and give them space to know that they're real. Uh, find social connection and emotional support. So how can our students begin to, to talk about these issues with their peers? And that kind of goes back to that Yale study that says 65% of adults care about this, but only 35% of them are talking about it. So how can we give them that community? How can we encourage action, whether that's collective or individual, so that they can put the knowledge that they have about the issues plus their skills into something that's meaningful. And then lastly, connecting with nature. How can we bring in the outside into our classrooms? So I'll turn it over to Danielle now to talk about using this framework in a class that she teaches. Thank you, Megan, I appreciate it. But before I get to the framework, I'd actually love to sort of reference something that Angela said at the end of her talk, because I thought it was really impactful. I love that notion of a closet edit because it really sort of like, gently transitions our students from a do as I say, not as I do mentality toward like an empowerment and self-reflective moment of taking the words and the learnings and putting it into action in their daily lives. I think that's super duper smart. Um, Megan, would you mind putting the slide back up with the framework? Thank you. Um, we're gonna just talk through this bit by bit. All right, so I find myself in the fairly luxurious um, position of three out of the four classes that I teach are sustainability oriented class classes. Um, so those are my innovation for social impact, which is management 360. I also teach um, an upper level class on sustainable entrepreneurship. Um, and then for the first time this coming semester, I'll be pulling a class that I created for WCL to COGOD and it's called mm -hmm. Sustainable Food Systems. Um, and so because they are sustainability themed classes, I have, you know, most of my students are either already impact oriented or they're like activation curious. Um, and so that means we start with a momentum that's sort of sweeping us all in the right direction. So I'll just, I'll talk through each element of this framework and I'm gonna, just as, as um, Angela did, I'm gonna provide some actionable examples of how I integrate the elements of the framework into my curricula. Um, so number one is fostering inner resilience and acknowledging the feeling. So I start every single semester by asking each student what inspired them to enroll in a sustainability oriented class and acknowledging the scope of the challenge that we're collectively facing, along with sort of that urgency for action. And in so doing, I explicitly offer my class as an antidote to eco-anxiety, because I truly and deeply believe that empowerment is the best remedy. 
So to that end, I really make a point to consistently design and connect all of my class activations and simulations to skills that they'll actually use to activate beyond the classroom. So whether that means developing their advocacy skills, building their public speaking confidence, or even just sort of buttressing their sustainability knowledge base, the idea is that it's all results oriented. It's not activities for the fun of activities, it's activities for the fun of building a skill set that will make them more impactful advocates beyond the classroom. And then in terms of fostering resilience, I don't know if you can see, I turn my wrist, that's an R. Um, that R stands for resilience. Um, and I show it to all of my students and I tell them the story of my own very public failure, the failure of one of my businesses. Um, and I explain what I learned from it, right? I attempt to normalize failure as part of the learning process and create assignments around building confidence in their own resilience. So one example is that, um, for one of their main oral presentations, they're all assigned a feedback partner. So they both give and receive both written and oral feedback to their colleagues. And they're then required to expressly incorporate that feedback in their next presentation. And I find that this really encourages the development of critical leadership skills, which is giving feedback and receiving feedback, but it also encourages humility and resilience um, because it's their job to, fi to find in someone else's presentation areas for improvement. So there are definitely, and I'll get to this in a moment, there are many an opportunity for the, the proverbial pat on the head after our oral presentations, but we also take the time to come together and prepare one another to succeed. Um, and I think that's really helpful in terms of helping them understand that um, shortcomings are opportunities for improvement. They're not reasons to beat yourself up. Um, and then the second example sort of on the same theme is that I take the time to solicit my students feedback on how my classes are going for them with enough time left in the semester to remedy areas where I may be falling short. And so the idea is that I'm trying to curate their confidence in speaking truth to power and also to encourage them to develop self-advocacy skills in the process. And this practice is really an overt effort for me to, you know, perfect the product market fit in my classes and to ensure that their investment is being maximized. But it's also a way in which I show them that I'm willing to fail right there in front of them. And that failure, again, is an opportunity for improvement rather than an embarrassment to be avoided at all costs. So the idea there is really that I'm modeling failure and resilience and by so doing, I'm normalizing both of them. So just to sort of tie that back together, like we have opportunities for them to develop their sense of resilience. And then I model the notion of falling short and not dying from it right in front of them. Um, so those are some ways in which I try to curate that notion of internal resilience in the classroom. Um, the sec second element of the framework is finding social connection and emotional support. So for this one, um, and this, this definitely comes out of my time owning and operating my own business, in every single class that I teach, we take the time at the front of the semester to create a set of class values. And the notion is that we're trying to build social connection and develop an authentic, emotionally supportive community in the classroom. Um, and again, I do this with every single class. And so we come up with sets of values and they, they differ wildly depending on the group of students in the room. Sometimes it's a series of phrases. Sometimes um, it actually was a Venn diagram in one of in my sustainable entrepreneurship class last semester. Uh, you know, sometimes it's simple words, sometimes it's full sentences, sometimes it's just phrases. But the point of this is that whatever the values we develop as a group, they become our shared language. We hold one another accountable to them. We revisit them often, very much including before every single oral presentation that they give, because they come into those days for presentations quite nervous most of the time. But when they're reminded of the really positive, affirming elements of the community that they've built for themselves in our classroom, they become naturally more confident when it becomes time to present because they understand that they're supported. They're being empowered rather than being judged. And then the corollary to that is at the end of every presentation day, we revisit the values explicitly 
And every single person that presented gets feedback from the co their colleagues about what they did well. And by doing that, we're able to ensure that every single presenter leaves the room with positive memories of the experience, rather than going home to beat themselves up over some mistake they think they made that no one else even noticed. And so that's a way in which we sort of activate the values to build public speaking confidence. Um, and I find this practice is, is super helpful because not only does it continue to build that crescendo of confidence throughout the semester, but it really fosters a sense of kind of in it togetherness in the room, which really helps in terms of finding that social connection and building emotional support, sort of speaking to the language of the, of the second plank of the framework. I just want to do a quick side note here. The values thing, I realize that it's it can sound a little woo-woo, but it can also, if it's if it's if it's constructed properly and it's deployed consistently, it is a community builder unlike any other. It really can foster a sense of emotional cohesion. It can give students not only a way to praise each other, but a way to correct each other respectfully. Um, and so um, if you decide to integrate values into your classrooms, the most if you if you take only one thing from me in this talk, the thing that I encourage you to take is values are not a set it and forget it proposition. If you spend time creating values at the beginning of the semester and they essentially become nothing more than like a poster on the classroom wall, reallocate the time, it was a complete waste, right? Like you've got to create them, but then you've got to revisit them on a regular basis. You've got to live them and incorporate them for them to really be animated in a way that's useful and actionable. Okay. Number three is encouraging action. So obviously this one's a bit of a layup in entrepreneurship classes because they are built around creative problem solving, right? Um, but I really do make an effort to ensure that all of our class activations around sustainability have a clear anchor in real world application. So I'm super explicit about connecting what we're learning to what they can do with the information beyond the classroom. And then I teach them through, you know, through simulations, through discussions, through activations, how to put those learnings into actions. So whether it's through debates, small group conversations, we do mini presentations, we do tons of simulations that are connecting the class prep to current events. And the point is by doing it that way, they know they're building toward a crescendo. And that crescendo is a preparedness to engage both in the classroom and beyond. And that is the antidote to eco anxiety, that knowledge backed, skills driven sense of empowerment. Um, and then that brings us to plank number four, which is connecting with nature. And I'm going to put Megan directly on the spot. Um, I, you know, as, as I'm sure many of us uh, have, I have achieved my, my green teaching certification with all my many, many apples. Um, and one of the commitments that I made was to tell my students about the AU sustainability tour, but always wanting to exceed expectations. I actually bring all of my students on the AU sustainability tour. So depending on whether the warm part is at the beginning of the semester or at the end of the semester, we either go early or late, um, but I take every class on Megan's amazing, amazing AU sustainability walking tour. So it, it takes about an hour, um, but she's, she's flexible. So don't be scared. It's worth doing even if you only have half an hour. But the idea is that we walk around school and we observe what's happening around us. We learn about the sustainability commitments, not just made, but honored on the AU campus. And that really helps my students to build situational awareness. And by the way, also some school pride, which never hurt anybody, right? It gives them a roadmap of what's possible. It inspires them to think about, you know, frankly, Megan, I think we can agree, it inspires them to think about where we could possibly be doing even more as an AU community. Um, and frankly, it's also like really fun. Um, and it's another great class community builder. So that one's super easy. Um, connecting with nature, we can all check the box. Send Megan an email, sign up for this tour. It's it's really a lot of fun and the kids really, really enjoy it. Um, so just to sort of like circle back and make sure that everyone we're on the same page, um, I, I would love for you to consider overtly acknowledging the issue of eco-anxiety and creating some experiential learning opportunities around knowledge-based empowerment. Um, if you're up for doing the class values thing, it is a phenomenal way to build community and to provide emotional support 
If that's something that still seems a little too woo-woo, send me a note. Um, I would love to work with you one-on-one -on, -one on how to do this in a way that feels like empowering instead of embarrassing, right? Because I think that the upside is worth that investment. Um, third, you know, I, I know we're all doing this, but again, just to, to exclamation point it, let's create assignments that actually connect sustainability learnings to real world action and make the effort to draw that connection, right? We wanna to explain to our students that we're preparing them for advocacy beyond the classroom, and then one last time, schedule the AU sustainability tour. Um, and then finally, I think I, oh my goodness, I'm over time. In 30 seconds or less, finally, um, as Megan explained at the beginning of her presentation, our third learning outcome aspiration for this session was to create community between departments that are working to include sustainability in our courses. So to that end, I would love to volunteer to help anyone interested in developing sustainability simulations or other experiential learning activations for their classes. I'd also absolutely be up for helping anyone who's interested in either getting or improving their green teaching certification and ways in which you can incorporate that into your classrooms and your syllabi. Um, and then finally, like, just please feel free to reach out to me if, if any of those things sound interesting to you, because obviously they, they light me up and I'd love to, to share them with you and bring that forward um, throughout the AU community. Thanks for listening. Thanks, Danielle. Thanks for the uh, plug for tours. Um, I dropped our email and you can email me directly or you can just email sustainability at American to schedule a tour. And we all love giving them in our office uh, just as much as uh, you can imagine. Um, and it is always really interesting to hear what students are asking us about because it does help us to figure out where we should focus our next efforts and, and what needs to be addressed based on what students are observing. So. Uh, before we jump into a discussion, I just want to highlight this idea of continuing the conversation. So we would really like to host ongoing conversations for people who are talking about sustainability in their classes to share things that are working really well, things that are creating some real challenges for them, tools that they have found to be really useful, things that they're like hurdles that they're trying to overcome and would love some input on. Um, and so I would like to invite you all to just drop in the chat what you think might work best for you. Do you want some virtual opportunities, some in-person coffee hours where we can all chat together? Um, how frequent would you like to meet? Any thoughts that you have on this, we would really welcome as we begin to create these opportunities for everyone. We really want to make sure we're creating something that's useful and that works for everyone that wants to participate. Um, and we'll be really kind of kicking this off today. Uh, one of the breakout sessions at 4.15 today is about incorporating sustainability in classes, and so um, I'd like to invite you all to join me there. Um, I'll share a little bit more about the resources that my office has in addition to the tour that we can offer to faculty who are perhaps new to bringing sustainability into their class and are, are looking for what resources um, might already be out there for you. So I'll share that and then we'll have a nice discussion around including sustainability in the classes. So with that, um, I'd love to open it up for questions and comments about the two frameworks you saw today. If you're teaching a class this semester that you're already thinking about how you might incorporate one of these frameworks into, um, please don't be shy. We would love to hear what you're what you're brainstorming about already. And you can drop it in the chat or raise your hand to just talk. Um, is anyone teaching a class that they're thinking one of these frameworks might fit really well into? Is this thing on? <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, I see some things in the chat that seem relevant. Um, Lindsay O'Neill said, one of my classes assigned sending letters to the editor and five got published. It was a great and empowering exercise. I love that as a assignment that also has, you know, very real connections beyond the classroom that, um, you know, as it says there is empowering, is actually engaging in, um, you know, putting, what we're doing in the classroom in practice in, you know, broader context. So I love that idea. Um, 
And we've got from Rebecca Comfort here, the Humanities Lab has a group starting up that's interested in climate activism through the lens of poetry and other artistic endeavors. Might be interesting to connect. That is so cool. Um, I, I mean, I'm you know in the literature department, so of course I'm interested in um, climate-related activism and poetry and artistic endeavors. Like, of course I am. But that being said, you know, it just is a very um, exciting exciting approach. I think we need to bring as much interdisciplinarity as possible into how we're tackling the climate problem. Uh, yeah, Caroline? Um, thanks, this has been a great session. I sort of similar but different teach a course, as you may all know, AUX2, so the core 200 course for incoming first years, focus a little bit more, sorry, around race and racism, but I do, similar to that framework from, oh, I forgot her name, the first one that had the three sort, like, what are you passionate about, what are the needs, and um, then what can you do framework, I think is a really great one. Um, wondering, outside of, like, sustain, like doing the sustainability tour, um, I try to get my students to focus on personal, local, and immediate, so focusing on AU, do they want to write articles on it. Do they want to do this? Um, I know there's in the sustainability office, a lot of different programmings, like the green eco reps or different things, but what are ways there's like beekeeping club maybe as well. Um, but wondering, yeah, I'd like, if we have these regular meetups, would love some of the student clubs to come maybe as well and bring that engagement and see how they interact and how we can have the more communal one. Cause I know a group of students created the sunrise at a U student club for a while and they were pretty big trying to push for, I can't remember all the terms they use. I think it was like a green new deal, but specifically for like AU and different things. Um, yeah, no, but I'm, this is fascinating. Those are just thoughts I had that I wanted to share. I love that idea of bringing the students um, in as like guest speakers <laughs> to, um, to share what they're doing in their outside worlds to connect, um, to create their own community and to connect with climate action collectively. There's a, a lot of action that's happening kind of behind the scenes, as it were, um, in our student groups. Um, I mean, you named a number of the groups, but there are a handful more. The community garden is certainly one that's really focused on their community. And uh, I, I really love that idea. There is a, a question in the chat as well. Um, if we could elaborate more on how the virtual eco component is used within class or maybe the lesson plan that could go with that outlet. Um, Angela or Danielle, would you like to? Um, I'm not quite sure what you mean by the virtual eco component. I think maybe. like perhaps she's referring to a, a note higher up in the chat where Caroline said some virtual and some in-person. I think she was talking about uh -huh. like, faculty and staff meeting up in terms of incorporating sustainability as opposed to like it being something that either you, I, or others are, are integrating in the classroom itself. I'm not sure that I have that right. Yeah, yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, we, we do in the um, uh, um, in the sustainability office, we do have some lesson plans that are available on our website. We worked with CTRL to create them a few years ago. And so um, there are a few lesson plan outlines that are available to faculty. Um, I'll get more into detail in them um, in the afternoon session if that's of interest to people. Um, but they are available on our website for any faculty who's looking to find a new way to incorporate um, anything environmental into their classes really and so it looks not only at potentially what's going on on campus but if you're interested in just incorporating sustainability more broadly we have some information on that as well that is awesome i didn't know about that i'm super excited to check it out thank you thank you for that work <laughs> i'm gonna dig out the the link right now <laughs> uh, something else to be aware of um related to the sustainability tour I, my classes don't go on the sustainability tour. Um, the, you know, fashion, fast fashion industry isn't like a real direct path to AU campus sustainability practices in a lot of ways. Um, but something that um, has sort of come out of going, hey, I'm interested in the, the, you know, having my students do this, can we tailor this to the class that I'm teaching? 
Um, yes, the answer is, is yes. So um, the, oh, okay. Um, yes, so a, a really cool thing that has happened um, has been that I've had a, you know, tweaked version of that sustainability um, tour as a in-class speaker. Um, in you know every single semester I've taught this course. So it's looking specifically at, okay, waste in particular on campus and how that overlaps with um, you know fast fashion waste and um, you know some of the, the ways on that campus is you know on campus attempting to deal with fast fashion waste in particular. Um, wonk trade is a big way of um, you know, you know, trying to deal with that issue and other efforts as well. So uh, it is very possible to tailor that um, sustainability tour so that aligns a little bit closer with the specific um, climate aspect that you're working with in your course too. Um, <clears throat> Lindsay asked if there's something, or if there could be something similar to the green teaching program, but for students, and we do have an eco pledge program um, where students at the start of the year and then throughout the year are asked to pledge to um, commit to different environmental actions in their own lives. Um, it's a relatively new program. It started while everybody was remote and we've kept it going now that people are back. Um, so it's still kind of being uh, tailored each year to figure out how it can best fit our community needs. But I'm going to drop another link in the chat to all the student programs that we offer. Um, Perhaps some of them might be useful in a class that you're teaching to introduce students to or to use as an opportunity to create some climate action options for them. Um, in addition to the Eco Pledge program, we have an Eco Rep program where students can volunteer to work with our office. It's a two hour a week commitment on average. Um, and they work with us on things like compost education, um, tabling at different events that we do just to contribute to peer-to-peer -peer outreach across campus and, and helping our entire community be aware of what's going on on campus. And we created that program in response to student comments that we were seeing that as students were applying to AU, they heard all about sustainability and carbon neutrality. And then they got here and didn't feel like that level of um, information about sustainability matched what they were expecting. And so the, both the eco rep program and the eco pledge program are designed to create more opportunities for engagement around sustainability on our campus. But the more people they're hearing about sustainability from that aren't the sustainability office, the, the better off we all are. So um, I'm going to drop that link in the chat now. We only have about two more minutes left. Um, there's the uh, you can scan the QR code that Katrina popped up or just click on the link in the chat now for the survey to give us some feedback. We would love to hear from you. Um, if anyone has a last question, we'd be happy to answer that before time. So, Megan, I see in the chat that um, Susan's recommending that we add an advocacy component to the green teaching guidelines, which I think is a dope suggestion what's the process for that like how do we modify if if at all the green teaching commitments so ctrl actually is the organization behind green teaching um it is anna olson's brainchild uh she created that program many years ago now and other schools have modeled similar programs off after what she created um so i will be glad to pass that suggestion on to anna cool thank you Oh, and Lindsay helps run the program, so she can also pass it along. Thanks, Lindsay. <laughs> well, I will thank everyone again for joining us today. I've really enjoyed hearing from all of you and appreciate you taking the time to chat about eco-anxiety with us and really look forward to continuing this conversation. So thank you again. Thank you, Megan. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Megan. Thank you. Thank you. Susan said in the chat to keep breathing. I like that. <laughs> <laughs>